Hey everybody, this is Greg Pettix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pettixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to continue our scholarly research of Epic Illustrated Magazine. This is the ninth issue from December 1981. And uh, we start off with this gorgeous cover by Tim Conrad. Look at this thing. It's, except for this little centaur down here, it just looks like a photo, so much of this. I would think this was a photograph, especially if you blur your eyes a little. Pretty impressive. I like it. So uh, let's crack the issue open and see what's in this issue. A lot of good stuff. We got the overview again. A lot of good information about the contributors. And here we got the last two chapters of Metamorphous Odyssey by Jim Starlin. I gotta say, I'm kind of glad it's finally over. It was, a, uh, it's gone on a little too long, I think. And uh, especially Jim Starlin's painted, more painted art in the interview uh, following this. He kind of admits that this was a new thing for him and uh, it was a learning process. I just wish we didn't have to watch him learn how to paint. But, um, you know, it's not the worst thing, but yeah, it's just kind of dull, the art, and the story's been lagging. But we're finally at the climax. As we left off last issue, uh, Eknaten and Vanth Dreadstar are holding off these desperate Zygodian mercenaries because they know that uh, Eknaten's three acolytes are about to blow the infinity horn the doomsday device that's going to blow up the whole galaxy so they're fighting extra savagely because they're fighting for their lives but it happens finally if the time is right they blow the horn and the whole milky way galaxy uh starts getting destroyed it basically um takes energy from the 15th plane of existence and uh the have this interesting description of all the planes. The first two are like, you know, uh, our world of matter. And then the second one's energy, nuclear energy. And then the, the other ones are like kind of sorcerous realms. And uh, the 13th and 14th are the plane, planes of the gods. And then the 15th is like the high god. Uh, the, the one omnipotent force. So it happens, the whole uh, Milky Way galaxy destroyed. And uh, the three uh, characters who blew the infinity horn, they turn into beings of pure energy. They basically become gods. And now we see, uh, we kind of cut away, flash forward a lot. <laughs> it's like a million years later. And when the universe was destroyed, um, at the very last second, Ignaton made some, like, energy bubble and put him and Vanth in it and put him in suspended animation. So now we have, this is chapter 15, the last chapter. And they land on this planet in a totally different galaxy. It's, I think it's right next to the Milky Way. And Vanth is pretty pissed off. He's like, why'd you save my life? Why'd you, why'd you spare us? He's, and Knotten uh, says, this uh, galaxy's going to need your skill set. You're basically, you're a warrior. And uh, this galaxy's on the precipice, the same precipice that the Milky Way galaxy was. It's a time when things could become enlightened and wonderful with technology, or become it can become, you know, just as bad as the Zygodians made the Milky Way galaxy. And then he goads Vanth, and Vanth shoots him to death. He already had an arm ripped off. It seems kind of out of character that an argument, you know, after all, you now he's, he's going to kill Eknaten. I think Jim Starlin just wanted to wrap this up. So, uh, yeah, he says he did it on purpose. He goaded you into killing me because he doesn't want to live. But it's kind of like, but you have to live. And uh, Vanth buries Ignaten. And I guess he accepts his fate that he's going to have to live on and uh, help out this galaxy. Because he's a hero at heart. 
a reluctant one, but he's just still a hero. And then we have an interview with Jim Starlin after the galaxy dies. That's a pretty nice sketch of McNaughton. And Jim Starlin just lays out his plans for the post Metamorphos Odyssey. He's, he already has a graphic novel from Eclipse Enterprises, which continues the story. It's called The Price. Um, here's art from the Dreadstar graphic novel, which is coming out soon. So that'll be the third chapter in the Dreadstar saga. There's a picture of Jim Starlin. So here we have uh, The Last Centaur by Tim Conrad. And this is based on the cover painting. And we have a little prologue. Here's a preliminary sketch of that cover. He added a head, obviously. But he has a whole story behind it. And he writes it, it's a prose story. He also added all this kind of like freeze art. And it's really accomplished stuff. This is some good stuff. We get to see the cover without the logo. Beautiful. And it's kind of a story that it's kind of strangely told. Every other paragraph is a, a different story. But as we uh, read on, we realize they're closer than we think. Because one story turns out to be the story of the very first centaur. And the other story turns out to be the the story of the very last centaur. And at the end, they meet. Kind of whatever. It's pretty well written, actually. Um, kind of almost like a philosophical uh, thing. Some nice art there. There's Zeus. We have chapter two of Children of the Stars here. And uh, last, when we last encountered our our heroes, they were entering that gigantic tree of life. Inside the tree are people who worship the old ones. They at first think they're the old ones, but they don't. They're like, no, we just worship them. We're kind of like their priests. And they do have the power, though, to give Bronwyn uh, memories of her past. Uh, she finally sees what happened. Uh, these are her parents, and they they left uh, her and her brother in the woods near a place where they, they know she'll be found and taken care of. Because they have to fight this great evil, and they want them out of harm's way. And uh, they live in this city on top of a mountain. And this society was just a very enlightened, you know, just really good society. But people's hearts were turned. There's this uh, dark influence. People gave into the darkness. And their only reward for this was to be massacred. Here we see those... Uh, the Dark Ones from the first episode, Lord Nizanthor. He was the villain in the first one and two other Dark Lords. And they were gods of chaos. So these people worship them. They're like, give us the power. They're kind of like, you know, greedy now. But he just kills them. He has these minions and they massacre the whole, everyone in the city, including her parents. So uh, they've killed everyone in the city, these three Dark Lords, and they realize, oh, wait, but two just escaped. They know that Bronwyn and their brother are out there, and they've got to find them. For some reason, they have to kill every last one of the people in the city. So she tells uh, one of the uh, priests of the Old Ones, tells Bronwyn that she has to go to the Sea of Souls. And on the Sea of Souls, is there's a pebble for every soul that lives and one of them is Nazanthor's so she's got to go I'm sorry Nizanthor so she's got to go to this beach find his stone and destroy it and that's how she'll finally uh, kill Nizanthor and free her brother from his uh, spell um her her adoptive mother the witch lady she can't go and she has to go alone so she goes through this portal and comes out in the ocean. And we'll see what happens next issue. Once again, beautiful Charles Vess art. Really nice stuff. Here we have chapter one of Weird World, the Dragon Master of Klarn, 
written by Doug Munch, drawn by John Basima, inked by Marie Severin, and colored by, painted by Steve Olaf. And uh, we have a little introduction that tells you about all the appearances of Weird World before this, and the story, you know, thus far. We see a crazy little map of their world. The Land of the Dead, it looks like a skull, this island. The Mystic Isles look like little stars. <laughs> and this silly looking, it looks like a sock puppet. It's uh, some dragon looking island. So we see, uh, we start off with uh, the dark gods and the light gods doing their eternal struggle up in the heavens. And they're playing a chess game. And the dark god kind of gets the upper hand. So this causes things to change in Earth. And now we're introduced to Majestor, this evil wizard. And uh, he's got this minion here. And I'll find his name in a second. It's another, oh, Merkindor. So he, he feels this change in the cosmos. He's got, all of a sudden he's got new powers because the dark side has kind of gotten the upper hand temporarily. And he gives Mackindor, let me double check on that, Merkindor, he gives him a, a bit of power from this, this dark force so he can go on this mission. And he also, um, is going to corrupt uh, this elf woman. She's a, the lead female character in Weird World. Uh, so she is this glass statue, and as it fills up with black, she's going to become more and more corrupted. So is she and Tyndall, her boyfriend, the other uh, elf, they're like in this dwarf town where they're not really accepted. They don't really like them. And she's got all these chores to do. She's bitching. Oh, here we see they're in Tree Haven. That's where the dwarfs live. I really like this. I think I can really see the Marie Severin inking over John Basima. I've never seen John Basima have such a kind of nice, loose style. But this is pretty cool. This like weird tree city. And one of the dwarves is chastising her for not working hard enough. And she's like, fuck you. She's getting really, uh, that black liquid's getting a little higher up in her glass statue. Yeah, her name's Valana. So they've been in love for a long time, and um, they're uh, and she's just getting more and more mean. That uh, th that Majestor is really uh, corrupting her soul. He makes her a token of love. She kicks it over. She's never been like this before. So Tyndall's crying. He's like, "What the hell's going on?" And then we cut away to the floating city of Klarn. It's this uh, circular donut shaped thing that uh, is in the sky and that's where the elves live. They've been trying to get back to this elf city for a long time, but they can't. There's no way to get up there. That's why they're just close to it, hoping for to figure out some way. We find out that these uh, the elves guard these sleeping dragons and uh, as long as the sleep crystal stands between them and the sky, heating them with the sun's rays, they remain torpid and docile. So they have this mystic crystal that constantly bathes them in the sun's warmth and it keeps the dragons just kind of from going crazy. So, uh, Majestor's minion, he uses some of that power he gave him and he steals the crystal. It blows it up into a million shards and then it goes into his cart and he rides off. So the elves are building all this fire, hoping that the fire will keep them warm enough, the dragons, so they won't wake up. All of a sudden, uh, Tyndall and Velana's buddy, Mudbutt, he, he's a dwarf, but he's their friend. He's been in many adventures with them, if you've read other Weird World comics. And he comes back, and he's kind of agitated. He's like, we gotta go to Skyhook Mountain. There's this great threat rising there, you know? And apparently, because this uh, that chess game at the beginning, lots of bad things are happening. The evil dark side is kind of winning over in this world. And uh, the nights are growing longer. Uh, certain towns are having strange phenomena. Um, women are tossing their infants into fires. Just, It's a nasty, bad time. 
And Valana's just getting more and more corrupted. Her little glass statue's filling up. So, uh, uh, the minion comes back with the crystal. We gotta continue on page 92. And uh, Majestor reassembles it, but turns it into this agent of the dark forces. And then we cut back to Klarn. The dragons are free and they're going crazy. They're just burning everything down. Because that's what dragons like to do when they're not sleepy. So uh, then the dragons come down to the tree haven and they start attacking. And they're burning it. And then all of a sudden, uh, Tindo kind of goes into a trance. He's totally calm. And he sits down. And he uh, starts reciting, like singing this song he didn't even know he knew. And it seems that uh, it makes the dragons fly away. It's almost like he controlled them. Doesn't even know what he did though. He was like in a trance. So when he comes back down, the dwarves are like, you know, it's all your fault, you damn elves. You know, you caused this. And he says, but I stopped them. I don't know how, but I did with that song I sang. And they're like a likely story. Elves have always spelled evil. So they kicked them out. And uh, all three of them go off to that skyhook place to fight this new evil. And then we see uh, Majestor. He's reassembled the, the crystal into this like black sail for his ship. And it's making his ship go really fast. And uh, he's on a mission. And then we see the gods. And uh, they've got further schemes and manipulations up their sleeve. Not so great. <laughs> this is a really good article. Tales of Torment, Horror Fantasy from the Underground. It's just this really informative article. I remember as a kid being fascinated by this because I didn't know anything about underground comics. And this focuses on, focuses on mostly the horror comics from the underground, like Boogeyman by Rory Hayes and Insect Fear, and Skull. They have lots of nice art. It's really well written. This guy knows his stuff. He's basically tying in these horror comics with the times. How uh, this dark time in the late 60s with people, you know, Vietnam, massacres being on national TV every night on the news, and all these assassinations, you know, people weren't in a happy place. So these horror comics kind of thrived. Really good article. Here we have Lee Mars, speaking of underground. And uh, she, uh, she did a lot of science fiction stories for Heavy Metal and Star Reach and uh, Epic. So it's called Match and Set. And we see these, uh, a man and a woman. There seems to be a referee and when he blows the whistle, they just start trying to kill each other. It's like some kind of gladiatorial combat. You know, one man, one person left standing. And they're doing all these elaborate things. They've got uh, various uh, implements of destruction they've paid for. And uh, decoys and jetpacks. And they're really, they're really going out there trying to kill each other. And they're taunting each other. And we realize they know each other pretty well. And then they're on this ledge. It looks like the woman's got the upper hand here and has got her, this guy, in a, um, in a bind, literally. And the ledge breaks and they both fall off. So the, the rope that she had him tied up with, just by luck, it lands, kind of like wraps around this rock. So they, it breaks their fall. They're pretty beat up. And they realize they're going to have to work together to shimmy down this this uh, pinnacle, what, this uh, obelisk. And, you know, they're, as they do, their their language is kind of softening to each other. And when they get down, they uh, their ordeal has brought them closer together. And they don't want to kill each other anymore. And they hug. And we realize that they're husband and wife. And then we pull back. They walk off all happy. 
And then we realize it's the marriage council arena. So in this future, this is how uh, couples who are sick of each other work out their problems. And we see all these bickering couples in line. This is kind of interesting. In 1981, we see a, a lesbian couple. You wouldn't often see that in 1981. Even the implication. Oh, this is some beautiful shit. We got P. Craig Russell, Isolation and Illusion. And it's all in pencil. And they're beautiful pencils. So he didn't eat this. He just wanted it to have a dreamlike quality. And it is a very dreamlike story. It doesn't make much sense. It's like a poem, you know. You know, he calls it a symbolist fantasy. But look at this gorgeous P. Craig Russell art. This is Angel Guy. I don't know what the hell's going on in this comic, but it's beautiful. Obviously, there's lots of, like, metaphors going on and symbolism. That panel right there, that is a face. That's a real artist right there. See this crazy city. I hope you're watching this on a big screen. This is some nice stuff. It's gorgeous. Though I gotta admit, I'd kinda like to see it in color. Another beautiful face right there. Such a good artist, P. Greg Russell. I love the pencil work on here, the trees, the shading. Really nice stuff. Yeah, I don't got much to say about this except I fucking love it. Don't this doesn't really make much sense to me. It's beautiful architecture here. So good. The anatomy is just flawless. It's like a Renaissance painting. Very Art Nouveau, Nouveau panel here. Very nice. God, it's amazing. So good. And uh, I, I think this is a, Ma a Maeterlinck quote. It says, beauty without the beloved is like a sword through the heart. So I guess that's what we should take from that. And here's the letter page. And we're done. That's epic number nine. Epic illustrated. Uh, I guess not the best issue. <laughs> I'm a little uh, disappointed by this. Two not so great chapters of Metamorphosis Odyssey. Weird world. I'm sad this is going to go on for like four or five issues, it says. But we still got Charles Vest. We still got this beautiful Tim Conrad stuff and P. Craig Russell. So there you have it. Uh, in a few episodes, we'll be doing epic number 10. And I hope you join me for that. So have a good night. And uh, thanks for watching the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies.